Welcome to the One God Report podcast. This podcast, we're going to talk about miracles, especially the miracles of Jesus, but biblical miracles in general. Just a few observations and comments about the miraculous in the scripture. First, one of the main reasons for miracles, as described in the Bible, is to give evidence or confirmation that Yahweh, Jehovah, God, is involved in the affairs of man. And oftentimes, miracles accompany the spoken words of God, God through his prophet, and then a miraculous event occurs, which is confirmation that indeed it is the Almighty God speaking through that prophet. A couple of good examples of this would be, of course, the exodus from Egypt, where a number of times the scriptures say that the events came upon Egypt so that both the Israelites and the Egyptians would know that Yudhe Vavhe Yahweh Hova is God. I'll just read a verse or two, Exodus chapter 7, verse 5. The Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Or Exodus 7, 17, By this you shall know that I am Yahweh. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood. So the miracle was a confirmation that Yahweh was involved and that Yahweh was speaking, that this is God. Now, sometimes Israel was warned to be careful because somebody who could perform miracles was not necessarily speaking from God. Sometimes there would be miracles that a false prophet could actually perform, and Yahweh was testing Israel, and they would know if this person was true or not, if that prophet was trying to draw them away from the God of their fathers, God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, if that was his intention. The miracles were, you were to disregard them. This is the teaching in Deuteronomy 13. It's also interesting to note that biblically, there are three main times historically when God broke forth with the miraculous. Three main periods, a strong concentration of the miraculous in the biblical narrative. And in these three times, there's sort of a pair, a double-barreled shotgun of miracles. If you think about the biblical miracles, you can pretty much start to categorize them into three main time periods. And the first, of course, would be the time of the exodus from Egypt and the conquest. And you see the pair there, where Moses predominantly being responsible for the miraculous deeds of God during the exodus, and then Joshua during the time of the conquest. So they came in a pair. There was sort of a grouping historically there, one right after the other. And think for a second, all of the Old Testament miracles, the, the next period would be the days of the prophets Elijah and Elisha. Again, here's a pair that comes along. And during this time in the northern kingdom when there's wickedness, these two prophets are sent, and Elijah is another good example of the miraculous being evidence that this is the one true God, where there was this contest on Mount Carmel when the fire came down from heaven and licked up the altar and the sacrifice and the water around it, and the people were on their knees saying, Jehovah, Yahweh is God, Yahweh is God. That was an evidence to them that God is involved. And then Elisha was that second of the barrels of the shotgun of that time where God intervened miraculously. Now, other than that, there's not that many miracles. There might be one odd one here and there outside of those two main periods, but not really. There are more, the, the events that maybe a person would say, well, that was a miracle, are a little more subtle. You can see that God is involved, for instance, in the return of Israel from Babylon. But it, that return was not accompanied by miracles like the bringing of Israel out of Egypt, the crossing through the Reed Sea and the manna provision in the wilderness. 
yeah, sure, Yahweh was involved in the bringing of Israel back out of Babylon, Persia, but it was uh, with the mundane affairs of international intrigue and king's decisions and so forth. And we're to understand that, of course, God was in it, but it was not with that same sort of miraculous flavor. The other time, biblically, when we have this pair of miracles punching through human history is, of course, in the New Testament period, first with Jesus and then with his apostles. Now, we're going to talk about the miracles of Jesus in just a second and how unique they are. But maybe just one comment. I know there's a big discussion on uh, the idea of can miracles still happen today? Is a person cessationist? Do they think that miracles are done now and God's not working that way anymore? Or if they're continuationist, that miracles are still being performed now? I don't think those are the only two choices. I, don't, I think you need another uh, choice or two in that multiple choice question. Because if you look again at biblical history, there are times, yes, when the Lord was not breaking through, let's say, into human history with these miraculous events, and at least not in sort of these uh, no fool around bona fide miracle. I mean, we use the word miracle sometimes as sort of a watered down version. You know, I needed the money and you know, I got a check in the mail just that day. Well, it was a miracle. Well, okay, that's not the kind of thing we're talking about in, in the biblical record. We're talking here about a, a different kind of miracle where people stand by it. And they said, well, this is, you know, this was God breaking through. Now, of course, we pray for the sick, like James said. The prayer for the sick can be effective, that the Lord would raise them up. But back to the question, do miracles happen today? I think it's important to keep in mind that there were periods in history when miracles weren't going on, but that doesn't mean they would stop. So let's leave this up to God. If he at a certain period in man's history wants to break through again with the miraculous, maybe a prophet comes and is empowered by God to do a miracle. Again, we have to be careful because is that prophet trying to draw us away from the one true God of the scriptures or not? That's the test. We may be tested with a false prophet and false miracles. If such a true prophet from God comes, he won't be preaching a multi-personed Godhead. A multi-person Godhead is not the God who brought Israel out of Egypt. A tri-personal Christian God is a Roman Byzantine, actually Cappadocian God. But I oftentimes think what could happen in the, the Jewish world to get the average Jewish person to pay attention to the gospel again. Well, in the New Testament, it was the signs that Jesus did and then that the apostles did. Peter was, was able to raise a lame man. Paul was able to heal the lame as well. These got people's attention. And uh, like Paul says, the Jews seek a sign. So let's not uh, put this past the Lord if he wants to break through in the miraculous again. But keep in mind that it's not always what Yahweh has done. And that's part of the nature of a miracle. I mean, how many times does God need to part the Reed Sea and bring a people through it for us to understand that this is Yahweh? How many times does he need to raise the Messiah from the dead? Does he need to do it every generation? No. That's the nature of the miraculous that makes us pay attention and say, wow, this must be God. So to move on to the miracles of Jesus, as a bit of a springboard, I wanted to read a verse from John chapter 10. I think many Israeli or Jewish people would be surprised that the New Testament describes Jesus coming to Jerusalem for the Feast of Hanukkah or dedication. And it's interesting to see the question here that he's asked as he's walking in the temple precincts and the porticos of Solomon. And the Judeans come up to him, they gather around him, and they ask the question, they say, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. So there's the question of, is this one the Messiah? When you read through the book of John, that's really the main question. It's not, is Jesus God or something like that? The question on the people's minds over and over again is, is this the Messiah? And as a matter of fact, the author of the Gospel of John says that's the reason he wrote about the signs that Jesus did so that we would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, right? The title for the King of Israel. Not that we would believe that he is God. So the signs that are recorded in the Gospel of John 
are given so that we would believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And it's interesting to see Jesus' answer to their question there at Hanukkah. This is in verse 25 of John chapter 10. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness to me. So Jesus' answer is, yeah, he said that he's the Messiah, but the way that they could really know is by the works that Jesus did in his Father's name. Now let's first of all make very clear that Jesus does not ever claim, and no apostle or no other New Testament writer ever claims that Jesus performed miracles because he was God. Quite to the contrary, Jesus and the apostles understood and proclaimed very clearly that Jesus did miracles by the authority and power given to him from God. Even in this verse, note that Jesus says, the works that I do in my Father's name, that is by the authority of the Father and also in agreement with the Father. Jesus was not doing miracles that would be contrary to the Father's will. He's doing them in the Father's name. But you can see this idea that Jesus was able to do miracles, not because he is God, as some Greek-thinking Gentile might suggest, but because God was working through him and in him. As Peter declared in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, this famous Pentecost sermon just 40 days after Jesus was raised from the dead, Peter says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. So Peter says very clearly, he understands that God did the works through the man, Jesus Christ. He makes a very similar statement again to the Gentile Cornelius, as recorded in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Peter describes that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. See, that's the Jewish understanding. You are a righteous person. God is with you. And that's how Jesus could do these miracles. This is what the religious leader Nicodemus said. No man can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. John chapter 3. So let's make that perfectly clear. There's no God the Son that does these miracles in Jesus. Jesus over and over again in the Gospel of John. How ironic that in the Trinitarian deity of Christ world, they want to say that the Gospel of John is the book that says that Jesus is God. But over and over again in this Gospel, Jesus says, I do nothing on my own authority. It is the Father who is at work in me. Listen to what Jesus said in John 14, 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. It's God in Christ that does his works. He didn't say it's God the Son who I am. That's how I could do the works. Or it's God the Son who who has taken my flesh, and that's why I can do these works. God the Son does not exist in the Gospel of John. Over and over again, Jesus says it's the Father who is God. It's the Father who dwells in him who does his works. That's Jesus' way of saying what Peter said in Acts chapter 2. God was with him. God did the miracles through him. And by the way, it's very interesting to see really just about every single one of the miracles in the Bible, there may be an exception or two, but for just about every single one of the miracles in the Bible, there is a human being involved. The miracles that God did in Egypt and in the Exodus were through Moses. Or the miracles that God did during the time of the conquest, Joshua was involved. And of course, Elijah and Elisha, these are human beings involved in the miraculous. They're channels through which God is doing these miracles. And of course, Jesus is not an exception. It's through Jesus that 
God was doing these miracles. There's a certain uniqueness to the miracles that Jesus did. So let's talk about the uniqueness of the miracles of Jesus. When they asked Jesus here in John 10, are you the Messiah? Jesus says, the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. Meaning, take a look at the works. You can know that I'm the Messiah. This is how we can know if Jesus is the Messiah. Yes, by what he said, but also by what he did. Jesus points to the works that bear witness to his Messiahship. And the, the works that Jesus did, the miracles that God did through him, were so unique, so grand, like nothing Israel nor anyone anywhere else on earth had ever seen before. After one of the miracles that Jesus did, the Israelites in the Galilee, in Matthew 9, verse 33, says, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel before. Now, that's quite a statement because this is the people of Israel. They've seen miracles like parting the Reed Sea that Moses did, but they recognize that Jesus was unique. In John 15, 24, Jesus said, If I had not done among them the works which no one else did. And another thing about the uniqueness of the miracles of Jesus is the sheer volume of them. I googled how many miracles are recorded in the New Testament, one source said there's 38 different miracles that Jesus did recorded in the New Testament. And then on top of that, there's many general statements like all the sick came to him and he healed them. So the uniqueness and the volume of miracles that Jesus did here, it, this is very striking and demands attention. It's interesting to compare some of the Jewish sources of miracle workers that perhaps had come around at this time, but it's not even a comparison. There's one guy sometimes that is pointed to, he's called Honi the Circle Drawer, because when the land of Israel needed rain, he stood in the dry earth and drew a circle around him and prayed to God, saying, you know, I'm not leaving this circle until rain comes, and then it came. Now, this is recorded much later in the Talmud, but, but this is something totally different than the record that we have of the miracles that are recorded in the, in the New Testament done by, especially by Jesus. The miracles of Jesus are not that type or fashion. We have this record of healing lepers and the lame and the blind. See, there's nobody in the Old Testament, no prophet, that healed the blind or the lame. These miracles are reserved for the Messiah and the Messianic age. In the city of Jerusalem, the two miracles that are given much attention, the Gospel of John, the healing of the lame man at the pool of Bethesda, and the healing of the blind man at the pool of Siloam, blind and the lame, as the prophet Isaiah expected and promised. Chapter 35, verses 5 to 6 of Isaiah, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. This is what's going on with Jesus, and that was how Jesus answered the question of even John the baptizer when John asked, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Jesus quoted the prophet Isaiah. So this is the evidence that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the miraculous events that God does through him. Now, just note one other thing about Jesus' statement that these works that he did in his father's name. These are not just random acts of the sensational, but they're intimately associated with the God who had revealed himself to ancient Israel. The miracles of Jesus were done not to draw people away from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Moses and the ancient prophets. Rather, his words and deeds revealed and proclaimed the God of Israel, that you might know that Yahweh is God. The works that Jesus did in the Father's name, these works were consistent with the character of God, our Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is a consistency and expectancy from the Tanakh, from the Old Testament, that Jesus fulfills. Today, one strike against the claim that Jesus is Messiah is that he didn't bring peace on earth. We still have the sick. We still have wars. We still have injustice. But a couple of things to answer that effort to discredit Jesus. 
first of all, look at what Jesus did do, just like Jesus says. Is it wrong for the Messiah to have healed the lame, the blind, to have raised the dead, and to be raised from the dead himself? Secondly, let's keep in mind that man's expectations of what Messiah should do may not be correct. Our job description of who Messiah is may be subtly twisted. And the third point is, it's fair to say, yes, Jesus has work yet to complete. But the signs that he did do on earth are samples, evidences, that he can and will finish the job. He didn't just come and say, you know, when I come back the next time, I'll heal the sick and the lame. I'll heal the blind. I'll raise the dead. No. He gave us a sample. He gave us a taste so that we're able to analyze it and say, wow, this is the guy that's designated by God to bring in that kingdom of righteousness. Yes, the world will experience peace and righteousness. Israel will be regathered. And again, we have enough evidence to know that the raised from the dead, Jesus, the Messiah from Nazareth, is the designated king of that age to come. Now, one other point I'd like to make about the miracles of Jesus, and that is, during the lifetime of Jesus, there were attempts to discredit his miracles. Some attributed his power to Satan. That just said outright, he's in league with Satan, and that's why he can do these works. You're probably thinking of a, a warning like in Deuteronomy chapter 13, that if somebody does miracles and they lead you away from the God of Israel, they're a false prophet. But not everybody went for that explanation, right? They would say, what, does somebody in league with Satan open the eyes of the blind? Also, his teaching, some of his sentences, some of his teaching was hard to understand. But somebody possessed of a demon doesn't give a teaching like the Sermon on the Mount. So I don't think that accusation stuck much or had much acceptance in the eyes of the average person. Some people, they called him crazy. They accused him of being insane in a couple of different places or in league with demons. So that was one of the ways that unbelievers tried to discredit Jesus in his time. Another way that especially the religious leaders tried to discredit Jesus, in the Gospels you have the record of them coming up and asking for a sign. And we kind of wonder, what are, you, what are they looking for? Wow, look at all the miracles he's done. But I think that is because most of the miracles of Jesus were not done in the view of multitudes. This is characteristic, the miracles that Jesus did. Even the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead did not appear to a lot of people. The situation that brings about is now others are going to be dependent on the testimony of a minority of eyewitnesses. So, I don't think either of these efforts, one, to claim he's in league with Satan, or two, to just sort of ignore or discredit Jesus by saying, well, let's see something. Let, let, we're, we're standing right here. Do it now. These accusations don't really stick with the average man on the street. Still, there's thousands of people following Jesus. And at one point, after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, even the religious leaders, if they thought the miracle was real or not, they acknowledge, what are we to do for this man performs many signs. They need to act. They were jealous of what Jesus did, and they were afraid that this was going to cause too much of a stir in the eyes of the Romans. So the explanations to discount or to discredit the miracles of Jesus in his own day, they didn't really work. The people still followed Jesus, and they could see the jealousy of the religious leaders and their goofball efforts to discredit Jesus. So these were lousy explanations, and the people could see right through them. I think the same can be said for people's discounting of the miracles of Jesus today. Now, how do people deal with the miracles of Jesus today? How do they say, well, we don't really need to pay attention to him? It's different now than in Jesus' day. It was difficult in Jesus' day to say, oh, there's nothing really supernatural here. Just move on. There's nothing there. But today you can do that because we're removed from 
period that Jesus was on earth historically by thousands of years. And today there is, in our modern world, there's a bit of a, a discrediting of the supernatural. Most people just live day to day in sort of their materialistic physical world. That idea and concept pervades our culture. and We don't, generally speaking, think too much about the supernatural. So they simply claim that these things didn't really happen. But they couldn't say that in Jesus' time. There were enough eyewitnesses to say, oh, yes, it did happen. But now, here we are, 2,000 years later, and people can claim that the miracles associated with Jesus didn't happen. These are only fables, they'll say. They discredit the miracles of Jesus. The claim is that some overzealous followers, years after Jesus lived, made up these stories and recorded them in the Gospels as we have them now today. But Jesus didn't really do them, but they're claiming that Jesus did them, or they attribute these things to some person that lived in the first century AD. But I think like in Jesus' time, the attempts to explain a way Jesus' works failed, so the attempts today to dismiss Jesus' miracles as fables also fail. And here's the reason why. We don't know exactly when the Gospels were written, but most of the scholarly world attempts to put the writing of the Gospels in 60s AD, some maybe a little bit later, some will put the Gospel of John into the 90s AD. There's some reasons to think that the Gospel of John may be written earlier, but generally speaking, it's the 60s, 70s, 80s, maybe 90s AD. But even if you want to remove the record by 30, 40, or 50 years, it's not a good explanation. If you think about it, and most people just don't think about it, they just ignore it. But if you really think about that attempt to discredit Jesus, it doesn't make sense. Here's why. As a parallel, here we are just into 2021. In 1994, there was a Orthodox Jewish rabbi by the name of Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who those among the Jewish stream called the Chabad movement, they said this man was the Messiah. Now, he died in 1994. That's about 30 years ago. Now, let's say that maybe now, or maybe in 10 years, 20 years even, somebody writes a book. And in the book, the author claims that when Menachem Mendel Schneerson was alive in the 1980s and 1990s, over 30 years ago, that the Rabbi Schneerson had changed water into wine or that he had healed the lame, or that he had walked on water, or that he had healed the blind and the deaf. And not only that he raised others from the dead several times, but that he himself actually was raised from the dead three days after they had put him in the grave. Let's say somebody wrote that book now or in 10 years. Do you think people would believe it actually happened, that the record was accurate, that the story would take the answer is no. That story wouldn't stick. People today would realize, no, these are made-up stories. They wouldn't believe it. Why? Because here we are 30 years after Menachem Mendel Schneerson has died, and there are people who are alive that would know that this so-called Schneerson gospel is a bunch of made-up fables. You can't go out and find anyone who is an eyewitness to these claims. The story wouldn't take. It's not going to be a story that a whole bunch of people would insist that this is true. It wouldn't be believed. And people would not give their lives to defend it. So this is what those who want to discredit the miracles of Jesus say happened. They want to say that some 30 or 40, 50 years later, some conspiracy group of followers of Jesus got together and wrote a whole bunch of fables and stories about Jesus, miraculous things that he did. And then thousands of people believed it some 30 and 40, 50 years later. The theory is not logical. It doesn't make sense. We can see the holes in the theory. Like people in Jesus' day could see the holes trying to explain away the miracles of Jesus. Even so now, we would see, no, this is not right. Schneerson didn't do these things. Nobody's really going to believe it. And like I say, nobody's going to give their life for it, like happened with the apostles. 
these apostles were ready to give their life for this record. We have record not only in the New Testament, but in secular literature of the death of the apostles. For instance, the Jewish historian Josephus describes the putting to death of James, the brother of Jesus, just after 60 AD, probably around 62 AD. Why was James the brother of Jesus? And why was James the brother of John, as is recorded in the book of Acts chapter 12, willing to give his life? Because he was an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's why. You don't have people that are going to be willing to give their life for the Manachem Schneerson story because they were not eyewitnesses to the resurrection of their rabbi from the dead. So it's more logical. It makes more sense to understand that the miracles of Jesus really happened, that even though some people tried to explain them away, they couldn't do it. Why? Because they were real. There were still people around in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s and even the 90s AD who could testify to the veracity of the gospel record that these events were real. Nobody could come out with proof against it other than just saying they didn't want to believe it. It would have been so easy to discredit all of these claims in the 60s and 70s, but they couldn't be discredited. Here, listen to this written by the Apostle Paul in the book of Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 6. This is some 25 years after Jesus rose from the dead. Paul is saying that there were people alive at that time, some 25 years after the life of Jesus, who were eyewitnesses to his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 6. Then he, that's Jesus, appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Interesting that Paul uses the metaphor of sleeping for to die. But the point is, some 25 years after Jesus was raised from the dead, there were still people who were eyewitnesses, and they were ready to give their lives for their testimony. They could say, I saw Jesus alive. We saw Jesus alive after he was raised from the dead. See, it's more logical to understand that Jesus' miracles really occurred when we look back at the history of the first century than to think that somebody was making these things up. So even though a person can try to discredit the miracles of Jesus and say that these are just sort of fables that were made up later on and attributed to Jesus. When you look at what the scholarly world says concerning the date of the writing of the Gospels, even though we're not really sure when they're written, they're still put in the first century. And to think that somebody could write these records, the Gospels, describing all the miracles that Jesus did, and that 30 years later that it would take, that it would stick, that people would say, oh, yeah. Yeah, this guy must have done this miracles. It doesn't make sense. It's not a good explanation. The scholarly world should recognize that their understanding of when the Gospels were written is a lousy effort to try and discredit the miracles that are described in the New Testament. This leaves us with the truth that we have in Jesus an incredible supernatural display. God was at work in him. This is Bill Schlegel for the One God Report podcast. If you enjoy the podcast, please rate it and write a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. That will help others to find us and share the podcast on social media. For constructive discussion, you are welcome to join the One God Report Facebook group. Yishma'u anavim ve'yismachu. The humble will hear and rejoice.